Today, we continue to read from the Gospel of John. We're reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 19 through 31. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hand and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God, Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen me and yet come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in the book, but these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing, you may have life in his name. Peace be with you. That's the sermonic theme I'd like to use on this morning, peace be with you. I don't know if you guys remember, and you've had to live a little bit prior to 9-11 what life was like, at least if you were traveling by air. I remember prior to 9-11 the joy of traveling by air. I remember the joy of having those who loved you or liked you, being able to walk to your destination with you. I remember that people could sit with you when you got to the airport. If you got there early, your loved ones could sit down. You could get a bite to eat. What I really like is when you arrived at your destination and you walked off an airplane, you could be claimed. Like, yeah, I'm somebody, because somebody was there or family members were there to show their excitement, their love, as you walked off the plane and they hugged you. I really enjoyed going to the airport prior to 9-11. Now, since 9-11, things have changed a little bit. When you arrive, you get to walk off the plane all by yourself into a crowd of strangers. You can act like you're important, but there will be nobody there to greet you to show just how important you are. <laughs> you have to pay to check in your luggage now. Some places charge you more depending on how much your luggage weighs. Meals are no longer served. You used to get on the airplane, and if you traveled a couple of hours, you'd get a meal along the way, but not so. The treats are smaller and smaller and smaller. And sometimes even airlines want to charge for that. While humanity is getting bigger, it seems like those seats sure are getting smaller and smaller. 
Seems like they're trying to cut costs any kind of way they can. There are all kinds of rules about carry-on bags. You have to walk up, you see the little thing, you have to stick it in, and all kind of penalties. If you carry your bag to the plane, and supposedly it doesn't fit in, some places like Spirit, who doesn't have Spirit, wants to charge you more money in the Spirit. I'm just playing with y'all a little bit. Now you have to go through security, and God forbid you wore your high tops or something. You got a strip, or you might get a spontaneous search. Things are very different from point A to point B since 9-11. Greetings are important. I think of how families greet one another prior to 9-11. Greetings are important, and greetings are different. In different religions and in different cultures, things are done or exhibited. What means one thing in one culture can mean another thing in another culture, but greetings are important. There are the ways in which people show love and care towards one another when they first see each other. In some cultures, there are signs of intimacies that involve kisses and hugs and warm embrace. In other cultures, it's more of a verbal welcome and less physical in nature. In some cultures, depending on the nature of the visit, it involves food and celebration and sometimes even spirits. In some cultures, it involves music and dancing. Greetings are important. This is where we enter the biblical text today. The disciples had been locked up at home, and they didn't even get the memo, stay at home. They were holed up and locked in and living a little concealed because they did not know where they stood in society. They did not know where they stood on the hills of Jesus' death. They didn't know what was left or right. And so they were locked inside. They had not gotten to the resurrection as we did last Sunday. They were scared. Their minds had run away from them and they were worried. They did not know what to do next. There was a lot of sadness and shock. And then through closed locked doors and pulled shades, Jesus greets them, peace to you. In this reading, Jesus greets the disciples three times, peace to you. We do know that this was a new greeting and Jesus hadn't really done it before, but it continues for generations and generations, peace to you. The Greek word for peace in this text refers to a peace that is the product of good administration of both justice and goods. Peace is the result of a correct administration of not only legal justice, but also of goods of the land and the shared responsibility in the production of such bounty. Jesus is not only wishing the disciples peace, but also reminding them of their duty to be fair and to be just. Peace is not only a greeting, it's not only something that makes you feel good, it is something we engage in. It is hard to have peace sometimes, particularly now as we live with the news from day to day, it's hard to have peace. As I listen to the disparity of COVID-19, it's hard to have peace. As I look back and see how long it took our country to respond to this virus, my peace is shaken. As I look at places in Florida who have lifted the ban to stay at home, it's hard to have peace. As I look at the disparities of the virus among people of color, black and brown people, it's hard to have peace. As I look further, the eyesore of the care and treatment that some receive juxtapose others, it's hard to have peace. As I listen to innocent seniors in nursing homes and members of our society in contained areas, it is hard to have peace. When I listen to friends that are on the front line, it is hard to have peace. It's hard to have peace when you don't know how you're going to pay your bills. It's hard to have peace when you're sleeping with maybe not the enemy, but something close to the enemy. It's hard to have peace when things in your life are turned upside down. It's hard to have peace when you're dealing with mental, physical challenges and health challenges. It's hard to have peace when you're hungry. Sometimes it's hard to have peace. 
And I would imagine right now I'm not the only one struggling with having a little bit of peace. Our peace is shaken. That's right, our peace is shaken. And let's not even talk about the guy in the Oval Office running our country, which is exhausting. Our peace is shaken. Have you ever lived with someone and it wasn't working? No, seriously. Have you ever lived with someone to hopefully improve your economic expenses? It sounds like a good idea in theory, like if you don't have enough money and somebody else doesn't, and if you put your eggs together and they put their eggs together, that maybe you guys can sustain yourself. As a pastor and a therapist, I get to hear a lot of stories where partnerships do not work out. You see, it's one thing to know somebody from afar and go out to eat with them and go to the movies, but it's another thing to live with somebody on a day-to-day -day basis. It takes the relationship to a whole nother level because you get to know that person in a way you've never known them. You see, the disciples had lived together with each other, and they'd lived together with Jesus, and they discovered the idiosyncrasies of each other. Their lives were transparent in the way that lives become transparent when you live with people, when you wake up in the morning with people. And they were struggling really bad. The disciples were struggling at this point in the text. They were going through something, and they didn't have peace. And right in the middle of the eye of the storm with the doors locked, Jesus appears. And Jesus says, peace to you. I got to appreciate Jesus right here. Because it's not what you say or when you say it, but it's how you say it. The spirit of how you say it. And if Jesus had a rhythm and a flow for being on point, he arrived at just the right time to encourage the disciples. He had to have known they were just at their breaking point. Yes, you've been locked up in this house peace be to you. Yes, you've been looking at these four walls, peace be with you. Yes, you love your kids, but they're about to get on your everlasting nerve, peace be with you. Yes, you're on the front lines as you go to work daily, peace be with you. Yes, you're afraid of catching the coronavirus, peace be with you. Yes, you still have to stay at home for another month. Peace be with you. Yes, United ain't opening its doors next Sunday. Peace be with you. <laughs> We've never witnessed anything like this before. In our lifetime, for most of us, as far as I know, everybody I'm talking, even those of you in my congregation in your 90s and 80s, we've never experienced anything like this before. Peace be with you. But it's not just the timing of Jesus' words, it's Jesus' presence. I imagine when they saw him, they remembered the time they were in the storm when Jesus was fast asleep. They remember the boat idling, moving up and down. They remember the fear that crept into their hearts. They woke him up and he spoke to the condition of their situation. And in that moment, they felt some peace. As much as his words comforted them, it was his presence that sealed the deal of peace. Feeling his hands and seeing where the nails had been, he invited them to touch him and expect him and know for themselves that Jesus is real. It was an act of intimacy and touch and taking it all in. This is in fact Jesus. And as many times as he needed to do it, he was present to their pain and their situation. And once they knew it was Jesus, they felt peace. Yes, I know even Thomas came around. I know for myself. I don't have to rely on what anybody else tells me. I know it for myself that this is Jesus. There are some people who will call you when you're happy. There are some people who will call you when maybe you're not so happy. There are some people who will call you when you get in a jam. There are some people that you can call when you need a word of inspiration. There are some people you will call when you need a comforting word. There are some people you will call when you need them to keep it 100% real. And then there are some people when you, you will call 
when you need them to tell you a lie. Somebody ought to tell the truth this morning. Sometimes we don't know the truth and we know just who to call that will tell us a lie to make us feel good in that moment. And then there's times when we call on the name of Jesus. There are times when we call Jesus because Jesus gives us that peace. Because we need that peace that only Jesus can offer. The scripture says that kings and kingdoms will all pass away. There's something about the name of Jesus. There's something not just about the name. There's something about the presence of Jesus that gives us peace. I don't know about you this morning, but I, I need some peace. It is dynamic and powerful that something that started with Jesus greeting the disciples, peace to you, continues today. It's powerful that way back then all the way to now, even in our congregation, if you were here today, we'd say, may the peace of Christ be with you. And the response would be, I think I can hear you. And also with you. It's amazing because then I began to look at what are some of the traditions of other churches, other religions. In the Muslim faith, in the Muslim faith, the greeting for each other is assalamu alaikum. And assalamu alaikum in the Muslim tradition means peace be unto you. Then I went over to the Jewish tradition and they say alika, well I can't pronounce it so I'm not even going to butcher it. But what it means in English is upon you be peace. And then I went to look in other faith traditions. In the Hindu and Buddhist tradition, one is greeted with the word namaste. And namaste means I bow to the divine in you. And then I looked over to the Sikhs who feed people, not just when there's COVID-19, but they feed people every day because they understand hunger on a different level. And their saying is, God is the ultimate truth. You see, in various religious traditions, there's different ways of greeting people, but in many religious traditions, the word peace is involved in the greeting. Peace is harmonious, but here today in the Greek translation, we are challenged to understand real peace involves us working daily towards a just and equitable society. According to the words of Martin Luther King, None of us are free until all of us are free. We have seen through a deadly virus just how interconnected we are. I was reading an article about a lady that came up here for a funeral, and by the time she left, 13 people were infected with the COVID. That's interconnectedness. We are moving in and out and through each other's lives. And if nothing else, we see through this virus how interconnected we are, how much we need each other. I hope it becomes crystal clear to you. Long before social distancing, Greg Daly was practicing social distance as um, a paper boy, a paper guy. He would deliver in central New Jersey newspapers, and he had the perfect aim. He would drive through the neighborhoods in central New Jersey, take out the paper, and he had just a good aim and whip it, and it would fall on people's lawns. None of his customers knew his name, and he didn't know their name, and he was fine with that. Greg had never done a day of any kind of volunteer service at all. But about a month ago, that changed. When one of his customers said, could you please put the newspaper closer to my garage? And so he pulled up into the driveway of this home and he put the newspaper by the garage. And Greg said it occurred to him if this senior citizen couldn't walk 20 feet to get her newspaper from her house, how is she going to get the things she needs? And so he decided to put a note in all of his newspapers saying, hello, I am Greg Daly and I deliver your newspaper. I would like to offer my services free of charge to anyone who needs groceries. Greg's phone has been ringing off the hook ever since. He has done a total of over 100 deliveries in his neighborhood. People ask when COVID-19 is over, will you stop? He says, I don't know. The word has gotten out. 
One customer calls him the closest thing to God that she's experienced. He doesn't even do his own groceries, and now he's doing everybody else. Peace to you, Jesus says. As God has sent me, I send you. As God has sent me, Jesus, I send you the disciples. As God has sent me, Jesus, I send you followers of Christ. Peace is not just something that falls in our laps, but it involves human activity, responding to Jesus, sending us into the world. I imagine each one of those seniors that, ex that got their groceries delivered by Greg, that they experienced a little bit of peace when how they were going to get their groceries was solved. I imagine the earth is experiencing a little bit of peace from us keeping our blessed assurances at home. I imagine our world might experience a little bit of peace if we can turn out the vote in the fall. We can all do our part. One of my Facebook friends, an atheist, has felt led to give to two people a week. Last week she thought, I don't have a lot of funds myself, so she skimped a little bit. But when she gave to this person, and the person began to cry in gratitude and said, I didn't know where I was going to get money from. She decided to give everything that she had decided to give. I imagine that that sister felt a little bit of peace. Whether by phone or by prayer or by presence or purse, we can share peace with others. This peace that is extended to us by Jesus, it's not just ours to hold to ourselves. It's meant for us to share and to make this world more fair and more equitable. I invite us to work towards a just and equitable society that makes peace a reality for all of God's humanity, all of God's creation. That's, after all, the real work of Easter, that we are sent into the world even with this new mandate of practicing social distance. Peace be with you. Amen. <laughs>